Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea with HGA. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager for the Hand Weavers Guild of America, and I'm the host today. Um, we will have, uh, today's episode is sponsored by uh, Marcy Petrini and Terry Dwyer. We thank them both very much for being our sponsors today. We will allow questions today, like the last 15 minutes of the hour, we'll take questions. If you would, please use the Q&A button and not the other button. It gets lost if you uh, use that one. Um, today, we have Deborah Robeson. Deborah has a wide range of knowledge in fiber. She specializes in spinning, knitting, weaving, although she experiments with all aspects of textiles. She's the author of the wonderful book, The Fleece and Fiber Source Book, and The Field Guide to Fleece in collaboration with livestock expert, Carol Icarius. For 14 years, she worked at Interweave Press. She edited both the books and spinoff magazine. And at one time, she was the editor for Shuttle Spindle and Die Pot. She has written for a variety of fiber magazines. And right now she has a DVD set available at Long Thread Media. She's a well-respected teacher, and she's right now offering a class on wool types on craftsy.com. She's currently researching the relationship between fiber animals and humans. So welcome. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Kathy. How are you? I am good. Good. I have a question for you before we start. I have heard people say Deb. I've heard people say Deborah. What do you like to be called? Just Deb. Deb. All right. When I publish, I'm Deborah. Yes. Because that keeps everything together. But yes. in, in life, I'm Deb. All right. Well, the most important question, of course, is when we start, what kind of tea do you like? Well, I have to show off my one of my favorite mugs, which is oh, that's this one. Um, I drink big mugs of tea. I like black tea. And I like, well, lately I've been drinking a Yunnan tea from Tea Trekker, which is in Western Massachusetts, where I used to live. So I, I'm kind of a tea snob a little bit. I don't I'm not fussy about it, many other things, but I let myself indulge in tea. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. I like that. So, yeah. Well, the best way to start is to ask, how did you come to fibers and spinning? I learned to sew before I learned to read. So I was approximately four when my mother put scissors, needle, fabric in my hands to keep me busy. And I would sew things for dolls and doll houses and things like that and it met, it went from there i kept moving backwards i mean i sewed a lot of my own clothes growing up and things like that my mother uh took classes in tailoring so the bar was very high around our household i bet and my grandmother taught me to knit when i was five my mother taught me a little bit of crochet and it just accumulated that's that's amazing. You have that much fiber around you for so long. Yeah. Well, you kind of, I think of you as like a fiber scientist or a fiber aficionado. Um, what was the catalyst that took you from being a spinner and a, a weaver and a knitter and a crocheter to wanting to know all there is to know about fiber and their sources? Probably basic curiosity. <laughs> Um, combined with, uh, when I began to spin in particular, I began weaving in the early 70s. Well, I, okay, I w began to weave when my grandmother gave me one of those little looms that they make for kids that is actually a loom, um, but it comes warped. I was probably 11. And the problem was once I had woven off that warp, no one knew Mm -hmm. to do so that was the end of that exercise um, when I was a camp counselor I had access to the looms after I got my 13 year olds in bed I was in charge of a cabin so I would go over and weave there but I really began weaving in about the early 1970s when I moved to Seattle and then I began spinning and this is where the answer comes around to you because at that point we 
couldn't get spinning wheels easily. We could, I, a friend gave me a drop spindle, which is how I started, but we had to order a dozen wheels wholesale from New Zealand in order to get them for our weaving guilds new spinning group. And we also couldn't get fiber. Mm. So digging into, okay, where does this stuff come from? How do we get the materials and tools to do this began that whole process. And I've just been digging ever since. <laughs> <laughs> well, you initiated a program called Save the Sheep Project. Would you tell us about that and why it was so important to you and why it should be important to us too? Sure. Um, I first became aware that many of the breeds of sheep that produce fibers that spinners depend on were endangered um, with the American Minor Breeds Conservancies Foundation. And then when I was editing Shuttle, Spindle and Die Pot, which I did during an interim period for the organization, I did it for a year during a transition, which the group had, um, I became aware of the Navajo Churro Sheep Project. Again, a rare breed. Then when I was at Interweave, at one point I was sitting on the lawn outside what is now called the main building at the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival. It used to be, I think, Building V, where Interweave had a booth. And I was talking with um, Don Bixby and Phil Sponenberg of the Livestock Conservancy. We were talking about what we could do as fiber folk to help keep these breeds going. And we came up with the, idea, with the idea of the Save the Sheep Project. So what we did was decide that we would have a competition for people to find rare breed wools and make things out of them and send them in to interweave where we would have a juried competition from which we would uh, develop a touring fine craft exhibition. This was about a two year project. Yeah. And it, it ended up with that exhibition, which was supposed to tour for a year. It actually ended up touring for two years because there was so much interest in it. And there was a book which was shown in one of the initial slides um, called Hand Spun Treasures from Rare Wools, which was essentially an exhibit catalog that also documented a great deal of um, that project beyond the exhibit. So that was the Save the Sheep project. It was a, it was a, it was a very big deal. Uh, we also developed out of that some, a slideshow that went around to guilds that was borrowable. And it, it went with not only the slides, but with uh, physical samples that people had made and sent in. So it was huge and it was wonderful. It sounds like, it. what a great idea and getting the local guilds involved, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, now I read that while you were working on this project that you realized that there wasn't really a comprehensive source of book guideline to all these sheep and especially the, the endangered sheep. So did that plant um, a seed in your brain to end up doing the fleece and fiber source book? Well, it's actually kind of a little more complicated than that. Um, when I began spinning, I was collecting articles and putting them in a binder about different sheep. So that's been going for a long time. When we started the Save the Sheep Project, I thought as editor of Spinoff that I would put an article in the magazine that summarized the fiber characteristics of the breeds that we were talking about so that people would know where they could start. So if somebody was saying, okay, I want to make a rug, they could say, okay, these are appropriate rug wools, or I want to make a shawl. These are appropriate shawl wools. And when I went to simply gather that information, I discovered it didn't exist. So for some of the breeds, that information could be found, but for some of them, it actually, in a collected 
manner still doesn't exist. So my goal at that point, I ended up publishing two articles in two adjacent issues of spinoff with as much information as I could gather about those breeds. But yeah, that information it was like, okay, I've fallen into a hole. I thought this would be out there. It's not. I'm going to be spending my nights trying to figure out what I'm going to tell people for this thing we've already started. <laughs> it's a lot of information. I mean, that book is so comprehensive. It's yeah. Amazing. Well, it's it, amazing. There was a progression too, because um, before we started the Save the Sheep project, I was at Interweave. I was an editor. I was an editor of books and magazines. Well, spinoff as a magazine. And one of the books that I initiated there, I was not its editor, but I said, we need this book, was In Sheep's Clothing by Nor Nola Fournier and Jane Fournier. So that was a 1995. And then we got the Save the Sheep Project going about 1998. Um, and then it was 2007 before Carol Acarius and I started working on the Fleece and Fiber Source book. So that happened after I left Interweave. It was a pro progression. Well, as an editor, you've been involved with some publications of books that are classics worldwide, like Alden Amos's Big Book of Hand Sprinting, Rita Burkannon's Weaver's Garden, and many of the hands-on uh, books, the hands-on series, which to this day are, most people would agree, are the books to go to when you want to learn a weave structure. When you were working on these, did you know at the time that these were going to be the gold standards for fiber arts for so long? I did know that we were working on substantial projects mm -hmm. that would have uh, long legs, shall we say. That's the expression. <laughs> Does a book have legs? Does it yeah. keep going? Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Weaver's Garden and Alden's book, partly because they bookend my time at Interweave. Oh, really? Yes. So a Weaver's Garden, I actually started before I was officially on staff. And Alden's book I did after I had left Interweave. So I did it as a freelancer. And when you're working on a book, you can have that sense that this one is absolutely rock solid. And of course, Interweave was really good to work for because we were allowed, um, I was allowed at that time, um, to let a book become what it needed to be. So it was not shoehorned into any sort of framework or page count or whatever. It's like it could go. So we could we could really do that. There is a book, as I've been thinking about this, that is a classic that I worked on that is out of print and should not be, you know, and that's painful. Uh, that particular book is The Knitter's Guide to Sweater Design. And it's by Carmen Michelson and Marianne Davis. And I hope somebody picks it up and gets it back in print sometime. Um, it is a treasure, but I'm always glad to see these books that we put our hearts into and our minds and everything else keep going. Um, I, it, it, it's a wonderful feeling to put together a book like that and then to see people be able to use it. Well, now that you've put that out to the universe, maybe we'll be seeing it. I hope so. Yes. No, it's, it's, you can find copies for a lot of money on the used book market, but it should be actually in a lot of people's hands. It's a wonderful book. I've actually worked from it. I worked for it while we were editing it to make sure that everything worked. So I know it inside and out. Um, I, people are asking us to list some of these books that we're talking about, and we'll try to get those on the, the chat so yeah. you all can keep track of them. I know we're, we're talking about a lot of books right now. Um, so um, so let's talk about spinning. Okay, let's talk about sure. your. Um, we have some images of your samples, and I know everybody's yeah. wanting to know this. What was the most difficult fiber for you to spin, and why? There it is. That's <laughs> that's the vicuña. Why? It is short. It is mm -hmm. very fine. Those aren't the big deals. The big deal is how expensive it is. It is absolutely terrifyingly expensive. So what you see on the left 
is my first attempts at spinning vicuña. In the middle is what I ended up spinning for fleece and fiber source book. It is the only fiber that I did not spin on the primary wheel that I used for the book, which mm -hmm. I can talk about in a minute. I had to go to a Tockley spindle. So one of the little coin spindles, a supported spindle uh, to get an acceptable yarn from that terrifying fiber. It's gorgeous. But when you think of what it costs, it's like you don't want to waste one, one iota of it. So that's why. Oh, I get it. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm assuming that you have um, a variety of wheels and everybody always wants to know, uh, how did you choose your favorite? And are there, do you look at your wheels and say, okay, if I'm doing this kind of project, I'm using this wheel. And I'm, if I'm doing this kind of project, I'm using this wheel. Or is there another criteria for you? It's a little more random than that. Is it? Yeah. I have a 1974 Ashford Traditional which has been repaired multiple times uh -huh. uh, because I've worn it out multiple times. Um, and it's still here in pride of place in my living room. I do not use it much, um, probably because I'd wear it out again. Um, <laughs> it was one of those, it, it only had one speed. So I added the little donut that you could get from straw into gold around it to add another speed to it. You know, it's, it's, it's been through the wars came as a kit, I put it together, I gave it a French polish. Um, love it. The entire fleece and fiber source book, except for the Vicuña, was spun on a borrowed Lendrum folding single treadle wheel, which I still have in borrowed state. And uh, it traveled with me really well. Um, I have a uh, Hansen mini spinner that I got, an electric spinner that I got because I was traveling to teach and everywhere I'd go, I'd have to borrow a wheel and then figure out how to get it back to somebody on my way to the airport. And the Hansen is a very nice tool. I thought I would only get it for teaching, but in fact, I use it a lot. Um, I really like it. I also have um, an electric eel wheel mini it's a nano actually it's a nano um which has now become one of my travel wheels because i can put it in my luggage and not worry about it it's a really inexpensive wheel um it's not as good for the super production work but it's terrific for a demo wheel and i have a an alden amos t-frame charka which i like and I have a cigar box charka that I built when we were publishing an article on how to build a cigar box charka in spinoff to make sure that all of the pieces could be obtained locally. I made one. So that's my wheel collection. I mostly at this point use the Hansen uh, because it is so easy to pull out and put away. And I am working in a very small space. So um, that's the wheel of choice at the moment. I know those um, little nanos are very popular, though it just kind of revolutionizes spin where you are. Yeah, they are so inexpensive. I mean, I put it in a little plastic box and I put it in my check through luggage, which I just cannot imagine doing that with a spinning wheel. Um, it's lightweight and um, I can do all the demo I need to do on it. Well, I, I put up the two books we've been talking about, your two books, they're in the chat. So um, I was trying to do that while you talk. So those are up there. So if people are asking. Um, well, the next question is, um, this is kind of along the lines I like to ask people, which is more important, the process or the product. And for you, I was wondering, do you spin just for spinning sake? Or do you, for example, we have an image of one of your sweaters. Now, would you spin the yarn and go, okay, here's my yarn, what am I gonna make with it? Or would you say, I wanna make a sweater, this is how I'm gonna spin it? I do both. Okay. And one of the reasons that you have this sweater as an example is because perfection is highly overrated. <laughs> okay. I spun the yarn for this sweater 
while I was writing editorials for Spinoff Magazine. So if I didn't have time for spinning throughout the entire production process, I would sit down when it was time to write the editorial and I would spin. I would always know if, if I'm spinning, I will be able to write the editorial. So this was editorial yarn. And I spun, I don't know, maybe two or three editorials worth, so maybe over six months, and then made the sweater from it because I had plenty of yarn. I have been wearing that sweater for more than 25 years. Um, it is something that I put on and actually it is within reach right now. Um, and, and that was not an intentional thing. I have spun, uh, I spin a lot while I'm thinking. So I will spin yarn just to think. But the thing about when I spin for a project, say I want an X and I'm going to spin for it. By the time I have spun the yarn, I've probably changed my mind about what I want to do with that yarn because I'm communing with it the whole time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, do I still want to make this object that I had in mind um, after I've spun the yarn? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. So it's both, but, but mostly I spin to spin and then I have yarn and then I think, what am I going to do with it? Mostly, okay. not always. Now, according to you, we're going to shift gears here. According to you, the American tunis sheep is an endangered species. And we've got some questions about that too. Um, why is that sheep endangered? And what causes a, a breed to become endangered? Why would that happen? Okay, American tunis is one of my favorite. Well, they're so um, cute. How, they are they? cute. They're born this sort of cinnamon color all over. And then it fades to this nice ivory wool, but their faces and legs retain the color. And this particular sheep uh, became endangered. It, it, it tolerates hot weather well. So it was in the Southeastern US, uh, predominantly up to the Civil War. Then the war came along and either the sheep were killed or they were eaten in the course of armies needing to be fed. So there were very few of them left at the end of the Civil War. That was one of the ways that sheep become endangered. Um, another way is that other breeds come along that are more um, economically productive. At this point in the state of the world, meat drives the sheep industry. So the breeds that are succeeding now are the ones that grow quickly to a large size and therefore feed the meat market well. Um, it is best if they have medium to quite fine, entirely white wool that can go into industrial processing. So you'll see white sheep that grow quickly to a large size that's what's going to be predominant right now. And any sheep that has colored wool, that goes, grows slowly, um, that is small, is going to be pushed to the side. Um, these, sh these sheep that are marginalized at this point have qualities that are lost in the larger, more economically viable breeds because they are great mothers. They can live on almost nothing. They can handle um, incredibly uh, hostile environments, actually. There are sheep on every continent except Antarctica um, in every little niche. And you will find that like the sheep that grow big need a lot of food. Mm -hmm. The sheep that stay little uh, they'll eat weeds, they'll eat thorns, they will just get along. So we have all of these qualities, including colored wool, in the sheep that become marginalized. So um, they get shoved over there, but we need to keep them for many, many reasons. Well, um, Carolyn Davinsky had a question, which is kind of along the lines of what we're talking about. It says, what is the criteria for someone, for a sheep to be classified as endangered? Okay, it depends on who's classifying. 
And there are different criteria in the US and the UK. But basically, it is either the number of those sheep that exist. Um, and in the US, we also look at the global population. So we are not looking only at the US population. We are looking at, OK, do we have some of these sheep um, that are globally rare as well? So there are two criteria there. In the UK, it is, um, I think the US, we need to check me on this, but I think it's the number of registrations also each year of new sheep. Anyway, in the, in the UK, it is the number of breeding ewes. OK, so there's, they're counting different directions. Um, but basically, is it a viable population? Do we have enough of these sheep counting one way or another? I didn't realize they kept such close tabs on the numbers. They do. Um, and it's a little dicey sometimes because for some breeds, um, there are shepherds who don't register their sheep. So there's no way quite to count them. Uh, but, but the organizations do the best they can and they work really hard at it. And they'll spend years evaluating whether a population is distinct enough to be considered a separate breed. One of those examples is um, the Gulf Coast native and the Florida cracker are now considered two separate breeds because over time, and with the help of DNA, which is really useful, they have determined that they are separate breeds, um, which is the problem being that they are both critically endangered. I mean, the, the group was critically endangered and now separate, they're even more critically they're really, endangered. They didn't really help the endangered part, did it? No, it didn't, except we can focus on them. There except you that we can, you know, it's like, okay, we can bring attention to them. Well, speaking of the, uh, the American tunas, we have locks um, and some of the yarn that you've spun Mm -hmm. Is and this may be a really dumb question, but is there a common characteristic of the fleece from these rare breeds? You've described why some of them why they're they're so they're not meat cheap, you know, they're fiber sheep. But is there a characteristic of the fiber that's consistent throughout? Or um, the characteristic that would be consistent would be diversity. <laughs> okay. Um, because we have everything from like the uh, Rommeldale and CVM, CVM California Variegated Mutant is a color pattern of Rommeldale, um, which is a very fine wool. You have the American Tunis, which is a mid-grade wool, ivory colored, lovely to work with. It's a great introduction to rare wools. Um, you have the Caracal, which is a mixed fiber. It's got, um, hair and an undercoat. It's fantastic rug wool. It felt like a dream. Um, so, and, and the long wools, I mean, the nice shiny long wools. So diversity, color, um, that sort of thing. Basically anything that's not pure white and middle to fine, all of that goes into the rare breed realm. Okay. Yeah. So much today. This is wonderful. It's fun. Okay. There is an image, we're shifting gears again. This is an image of a pattern that you used. It's the same pattern, I understand, but it's got different yarns. Okay. Can you it, share your thoughts on sampling? Because I'm sure. assuming this is what this was. I, I am a, um, it, it's possible that you could describe my entire fiber career as sampling because I always want to know what does this fiber do? What can we do with it? How do we manipulate these threads differently, whether we're weaving or crocheting or knitting or whatever? Um, how do all these materials and techniques go together? That's me, that's sampling. Um, this is the same object. It is a shawl. Um, on the left, um, what happened was I got the same fiber prepared woolen and worsted. So Woolen is the fibers are all evenly uh, dispersed, but jumbled. So it is the puffy type of yarn. Worsted means they're all parallel, smooth. It is the more durable yarn. So I got the same thing, um, same dye lots mm -hmm. in those two preparations. And you can see here the dark stripes in that right-hand picture are the worsted yarn 
And the light stripes where you can see light coming through is the woolen yarn. Uh, same thing. Now on the left, it's the same pattern, but what I found out was to get the contrast between the two, I did sample um, and then held it up to the light to see if I was getting what I wanted. Um, I had to make one of the stripes, the woolen stripes, wider. So I modified the pattern to get the result that I wanted. So there was a little sampling involved um, with the same pattern to get this demo object. Well, I, I, I stole this from your blog and, I, and you talked about what you liked and didn't like. So yeah, I'm always curious about sampling. I know it's a issue for- I, I sample like crazy. <laughs> I have boxes full of samples. I save my samples. I block my samples. They are a library. You're, you're a good person. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. I see it as a project. You know, it's, it's, it's a major multi-year project, my sample collection. It is. Well, I'm, I, I want to go back to, and, and somebody um, else commented on this, but I do want to go back to something you said earlier that when I was reading your blog, speaking of blog, um, you have some philosophical thoughts from time to time. And I know you do hours of spinning. So does that impact on your philosophizing or just your thinking? Because I've heard that spinning is kind of Zen-like and does that work for you in that way? Yes. And I do both thinking on my own while I'm spinning. So if I am working on a nutty project, like some, something I'm trying to think my way through. Um, I may grab a whole bunch of fiber and spin while I think. Because, I, okay, I have ADD. I am not hyperactive, but I do need something to do with my hands while my brain is working. So um, Knitting works, spinning works. Spinning works a little better than most knitting because I tend to pick out more challenging knitting projects. And spinning, I can just go by feel. Um, I also sometimes listen to books while I spin. That is less common, uh, but one of the books that I listened to while I was spinning for Fleece and Fiber Source book um, was called Destiny Disrupted, The History of the World Through Islamic Eyes by Tamim Ansari. And the fact that I remember it so well is partly because I was spinning as I was listening. I'm not a huge audiobook person. My daughter is. Um, but sometimes the right book, the right bit of spinning, and it, it becomes part of the mental framework. Um, there was a, another benefit of listening to that particular book, which is that Tamim uh, was born in Afghanistan. I happen to know him from way back, um, which meant that all the words, the names were pronounced correctly. And if I had been reading it visually in my head, I couldn't have done that. So that was a plus. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like yeah. that. That's yeah. great. Well, I have a question about one of your retreats. Well, your retreats. Yeah. Um, I know that's a, except for recently, that's something yeah. you do every year, right? Or twice a year? Normally twice a year. Yes. Why a retreat? I mean, you could just teach a class or have people come to you. Why a retreat? Um, they're kind of magic. <laughs> um, they are limited in numbers of people. So um, there are generally 15 to 20 people there. I think we may have had 22 once, but there's a limit to how many people we can put in the great room at the lodge that we use. Um, we use a lodge off season, so we have access to it. Um, it is a beautiful location in the San Juan Islands. Uh, we have amazing food. Um, and I can go in tremendous depth on a given topic. So they are four days long. And I've done one on primitive sheep and wools. I have done, uh, I've done a couple of them, just four days on Shetland wools because they are so complicated. Um, I have a format where I have done like a breed each day where those breeds are very different. 
Um, I've got one lined up. Should we ever be able to get back together in person, which I trust we will, um, we will be doing long wools. So all of the, the British long wools. Um, got one going on Gotland wools from different places. We'll talk about things like upgrading and, and the geographic differences in the same breed. We can do so much in so much depth in four days. Um, and the people in the groups who come, um, it's a very rich group of people, mentally and personally. And there's, there's a lot of exchange that goes on. Um, I love teaching shorter workshops, but I adore the long workshops. You start talking two days or more and I start getting into my sweet spot. Um, a half day workshop is like a teaser. Oh, I bet, I bet. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you, more, more is better. You are so passionate about your fibers, your sheep and your spinning. What's another passion for you? Let's say sheep, no sheep. You don't have any sheep anymore. So what would be your passion? Okay, we're going to tie back a little bit um, to what you're ta ta saying about being philosophical. Um, I have a master's in fiction writing. And yet what I learned after I earned that, which was in the late 70s. Yes, it was. Um, was that what I most enjoy writing are essays. So personal essays, and I've had it, several of them published, some of them in um, knitting related anthologies, some of them in uh, literary magazines and places like that. So I like to take something from my life and kind of tease out where its threads might go in a bigger sense. Um, so writing in general. Also music. Um, I, when the world is normal, am a shape note singer. So the, this is a traditional four-part a cappella um, harmony that has um, some unusual history and unusual sounds to it. It is participatory. It is not performatory. We don't perform for anyone. It's you, you go, oh, and one of the essays I wrote was about shape note singing. Um, I like acoustic music, a um, little bit of old time rock and roll, that sort of thing, some jazz, a uh, little bit of classical, depends on the type. So music, music, uh, painting, oil painting. I love to do oil painting and drawing. I mean, yes, I am absolutely passionate about fibers, but um, if I had no fibers, uh, there are other things lying around here that I could get into trouble with. You're a Renaissance woman. You're well, everything. I mentioned curiosity earlier. <laughs> yeah, it's there. Well, tell you what, let's ask some questions, get some questions from our audience. Okay. okay? Um, somebody was wanting to know if the Save the Sheep project is still available. Are those slides still floating around? Can you get them from somewhere? Not that I am aware of. Okay. Um, I have a set on the shelf, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know what has happened to the others. Mm -hmm. um, it was an Interweave Press project, um, and Long Thread Media now carries forward those Interweave things. Um, and I don't know whether it could be um, revitalized. I have the seed. Yeah, yeah. I can't grow it. I mean, physically, I, that's not something I can take on, but I have the seed. Um, Grace McFetters wants to know, and this is an interesting question. What advice would you give someone who wants to write a fiber related book that is not project centric? Depends on the topic. And um, there's writing it, and there's publishing it. And those are two entirely different things. So the writing part is getting the ideas together, shaping them, starting to put it together. Um, then there's the matter of thinking about, and it's sort of a parallel track, how do I want to share it with the world? And that could be anything from uh, 
I mean, at this point, what I'm doing with my little monographs is I'm putting them up on Etsy and on MagCloud. And that's totally intentional that it's not bigger than that because those two channels handle all the tax issues. So they will collect all the sales tax and deliver it. And I don't have to deal with that. That's huge. Um, it's also available either as PDF or in print. Um, and it's really pretty painless for me. Um, the other thing is to connect with one of the self-publishing platforms or a traditional publisher. Um, but the biggest thing is to get the idea together and start working on it, get a, get an, a mental outline, which can sometimes take a bunch of work. And then while you're at it, see, okay, is this something a larger publisher might be interested in? Um, and there aren't that many publishers out there doing this, but there are a handful and they are easy to identify. Um, and you put together an outline or a proposal as it's called, and there are books on putting together proposals um, and start approaching people if you wanna go that way. But self-publishing is totally valid these days and really accessible. Thanks, that's great information yeah. for folks who are interested, that's good. Uh, Mary Holm wants to know, please tell us about the beautiful striped shawl you're wearing. Yes, um, it is, oh, I would, ha I don't remember the pattern. Um, I'd have to look it up, but it is thin sheep. And it is a natural white and it is indigo dyed. And I made it while I was getting ready to do a series of videos last summer for the Hudson Valley textile project. Um, and those videos were released in conjunction with last fall's New York State Sheep and Wool Festival, also known as Rhinebeck, and they are available on YouTube. Um, so this was a demo project. Everything I do, it's a sample or a demo, because that's what I like to do. But um, one of the things I love about it is the color. And another thing that I love is how much shine there came through on, mm. on this particular fin. So that's well, Judy, Judy Howard says, I spin in the grease and love working with um, Leicester Longwood. Lester. Lester, Lester Longwood. Lester Longwood. Yes. And Coopworth. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what are the other comparable breeds? Okay. Um, Lincoln Longwood, Cotswold. And if you want to go in the same direction, but finer, either Blueface Lester or Gotland. There you go. Yep. She knows it all. Yep. Um, Marcy Petrini. Hi, Marcy. Hi, Marcy. She's our, our uh, sponsor for today. Marcy, you're the reason I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a bit about dual coat sheep, since that is one of your specialties. Right. Um, actually, wouldn't you know, uh, the new issue of Ply Magazine, which um, concentrates on spinning, is about double coated breeds. And they asked me to write an article on double coated and primitive. And they are not the same thing. So some primitive sheep have double coated fleeces, and some don't. Now, we talk about double coated, and the pure definition of that, which does not relate to many fleeces at all, is that there is a short undercoat that is fine, and a longer outer coat that is coarser. And in a truly double-coated fleece, and Icelandic probably is most often closest to this, you can separate out that longer coat if you choose to do so and end up with two fibers that are quite different. Hmm. Um, most fleeces have that, that, and this, area, gray area in between, making it much more difficult to separate the fibers. So you can separate, but you reach a point where you think, okay, have I gone far enough? There's more. And then you keep going and you think, oh, there's, there's no clear delineation. So for most of the double-coated fleeces that I run across, I don't separate. So I plan to use those two sets of fibers concurrently. Um, they make fantastic rug wools. Oh. Um, 
because you, you combine the squishiness of that undercoat with the durability of the outer coat and the combination of fibers. Um, example is the Navajo churro rugs um, that are on the floor at the trading post. I'm trying to think, it's not Ganado. I can see it, but um, it's a national park site. Uh -huh. And people have been walking on them for 50 years and they're still going. They're, I mean, it's like the durability is in the fiber. Um, so dual coated fibers, um, amazing for rugs, shoes, felts, tents, that sort of thing. I hope that was what Marcy wanted to know. <laughs> That's what she got. And that okay. Right. All go. right. Um, somebody says it's Hubble Trading Post. Is Thank you. Yes, Hubble is absolutely correct. Yes. Okay, Linda Johnson wants to know which sheep are the most prized in the commercial textile market? Merino. There we go. Yep. And can you speak, this is from Kerry Gordon. Can you, oh, no, Cindy Solomon. Can you speak to the controversy, controversy? Between wool, fine wool Shetlands and regular Shetlands? Ah, uh, this is very complicated. Oh. Um, and yes, it is a controversy. Oh. Um, and I am working on a huge project that um, is actually making my brain melt. And I hope that it will hold together long enough for me to finish it about Shetland sheep. Um, because we have any type of fleece that you want to find is available in the Shetland breed. So you can find a quote unquote, double coated fleece, although often they do not have that clear demarcation. You can also find what's called fine fleece Shetland, which is all consistent, fine, crimpy, without that second coat to it at all, um, and everything in between. And so if you as a spinner or fiber person would like to work with Shetland wool, you will need to decide what kind of Shetland you want, and you will have to connect with a shepherd who is growing that kind of wool. There are some shepherds who have the full range in their flock, including in Shetland. Um, so there is a lot of discussion about what is, what is Shetland, and people have different opinions. Um, and it's a very interesting and thorny area of research that I've been working on for a while. Um, and I've been to the Shetland Museum and Archives and I have pulled a lot of information from there that I am still working my way through um, because some of it is teeny, 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 teeny handwriting. <laughs> so I've got a lot of original material and I have not fully digested. And someday I may get that sorted out or not. What we really need is DNA studying the different groups of Shetlands oh, okay. to see how they relate to each other and whether there are infusions of other breeds that have left any vestiges in there. Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, there is some DNA research starting to happen. Jenny Holden Wild in the UK is, is doing some looking into color patterns. Um, and she and I have talked about my need for um, this additional type of study, which is beyond the capacity of what she can do right now, um, but maybe in, in the future. Well, um, to the next question, Paula Williams wants to know, um, what's your favorite drop spindle? Thinking. Uh, magpie. I, they're not made anymore, oh. unfortunately. Uh, well, maybe they are. I think somebody may have taken the business over. Um, there was a guy in Western Colorado making magpie spindles. And I really, really liked those. Um, woodchuck spindles are good too. And he's back on the scene, I think. So um, I basically it's individual spindles that I find. Um, I like them. Actually, my preferred spindle is about two ounces. Um, it's a top whorl. I learned on a four ounce bottom whorl, mm -hmm. um, which is heavy but it was well balanced. It was a really nice spindle. So um, it worked well, but yeah, I, I've gotten stuck on the top whorl spindles. 
Uh, Peg Blechman Blechman wants to know what can we do to save rare breeds? Spin their wool, or if you are not a spinner, find some that has been spun into yarn and use it. Basically, and you can join the livestock conservancy. That's huge. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, um, is the Save the Sheep project and the Shave Them to Save Them related, a continuation of? The Save the Sheep project was an idea that came about between me and the conservancy, uh -huh. but was carried out by Interweave Press. And uh, Shave Them to Save Them is the new version of what the Livestock Conservancy itself is doing mm. to get fiber folk involved. And I'm, I'm pretty deeply involved in that project. So um, it's, it's the sheep, the Livestock Conservancy, and this ongoing, um, how do we connect the fiber community and keep it going? But yeah, use the wool because um, shepherds need the money to keep their sheep fed and sheep, keep them going. Um, and uh, what a pleasure it is for us to be able to discover these fibers. I have sitting here um, the Tunis mittens that we saw earlier. I have some Navajo churro thrummed mittens. And I'm working on fingerless mitts out of Gulf Coast Native. These are all rare breeds on the Livestock Conservancy list. I'm using the fibers. And um, each one is different and it's a lot of fun. And that's one of the things you can do. Well, we have a couple of people, Pamela Feldman and Susie Zari. They want to know, are you doing natural dyeing at all with your wool? I am not now. I have done a lot in the past. Um, I actually have a stash of naturally dyed fibers that I have not processed. And the reason is that there's just too much else going on in my life. <laughs> um, I've done chemical dyeing as well, but um, uh, life's too short sometimes. Well, I liked it. I think it was Susie quest, put the question in the sense of, with all that curiosity. Are you yes, I've, I've been there. I've been there. Um, been there, done that, huh? Yes, I took a class in 1973, maybe, uh -huh. uh, with the Chicago Botanical Society with Linda Cannon, L-Y-N-D-A-C-A-N-N-O-N. And it was, oh, it was wonderful because we had access to um, plant material from the Botanic Garden. This was before the Botanic Garden actually was as fully fleshed as it is now. They were just, they had just gotten the property. They put up like a metal building um, and we met in that building and got to use all sorts of stuff from there and oh it was wonderful um i've done a bunch i've got still got a bunch of walnut dyed wool um so yes but yes that's another realm into which i could dive well we've had questions since you mentioned that about use the wool what, what's the good way to find these rare wools to go okay uh the shave them to save them project has done a lot to set up connections and that was its goal okay between producers and users. So there is a list on the Livestock Conservancy site that you can go, it's a breeder's list, and you can actually sort for who has wool, who has yarn. Um, you can do a filter thing on it and, and get stuff there. And we've just posted the Livestock Conservancy website. So, you okay. know, it sounds like that's your good starting point. It is. And you yes. can find it from there. Yeah. Um, we have tons of questions and a lot of these, I encourage you to um, contact you on your website, right, Deb? There's a contact form there, yes. Yeah. Um, and if I don't get back to you, try again because things get sometimes <laughs> lost in my email because I get a lot of email. So. Um, a lot of people asking about different fibers. Um, many Shetlands in the Shetland Islands have been crossbred for meat production. Did you find have a difficulty finding Shetland fleece for your fleas for your book? Um, no, I did not. Okay. Um, and the crossbreeding is actually a very systematic uh, process, where the Shetland ewes are mated to. Um, either Suffolk or uh, they're using Zvartless in there now. 
Um, they have used some Cheviot, some blackface, um, because they produce a lamb that is better meat. I'm a vegetarian, but really meat drives it. Um, so they still keep a lot of pure Shetland sheep. Reason being that they can survive on the hills, whereas the um, fancier sheep need to be down on better grazing. Um, we did not have trouble finding Shetland wool for the book. However, um, the picture at the beginning of me with like in this position mm -hmm. where you can't see what I'm spinning, okay? That was because we did that photo shoot. That was a photo shoot for the book. We did that when I was on the way back from Shetland. And I had been given some fiber there that we did not have a representation of in the book. Mm -hmm. So in order to get it into the photo shoot, I was spinning as we were taking pictures. Um, and when I've been in Shetland, I've had, I've, I've had no trouble getting Shetland fleeces um, from the Shetland, the wool brokers um, from Jameson and Smith. Um, they have a wool room that's in the bottom of the building where they do the grading. And you can go down there and you can find any grade of Shetland you want. Um, and yeah, no, you can find you can find what you need. Well, Linda Hardison was asking this. Um, what are your thoughts on people from one continent raising sheep from another area or country? And how does that impact on the rare breeds themselves? OK. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the US criteria look at the global population in terms of part of their definition of what's rare. There is a very strong argument for having satellite populations in other locales. Um, one of the things that's happened recently is that the Tees waters in the US are being considered as a rare breed because they are being accepted as valid by the UK Teeswater Breed Society. So we have what is now being considered a satellite population. And there's actually backstory on that, but um, it, the digression will take a while. Um, the Manx Lochten sheep from the Isle of Man, there is a satellite population in mainland UK. The reason being that we could have an environmental disaster or a um, pollution issue or something like that, which could take out the original population. Yeah. So there are really strong reasons to have sheep moved around, which we can't much now because of biosecurity. So there are issues with that. Um, but it is very good to have another group. Um, the the characteristics of the sheep and of their wool may change due to the environmental shift. And so we need to be aware of that. But yeah, um, it, it can be very helpful. Look, Deb, I'm just amazed at the amount of knowledge that you have. And I applaud the work you must have done to gather all this knowledge. Um, I could sit and talk to you forever. <laughs> I'm sure everybody else could too. Thank you so much for being on today and sharing with us everything that you know about sheep. <laughs> well, it's not everything yet. We aren't there yet. Um, I keep thinking I don't know anything and then people ask a question and then I can't stop talking. So thank you for asking me. Well, I encourage everybody to, you know, look up the book. And if you want more information about Deb Robeson, um, go on our website. She has this incredible um, blog. There's information about her books, about her research, all the other she's into everything. She is a busy, busy woman. Um, she is at independentstitch.com. Um, and again, special thank you to Marcy Petrini and Terry Dwyer for being our sponsors today. If you would like to sponsor Textiles and Tea or your company or your guild, um, please go to our website, weavespindye.org, and there's information on there on how you too can be a sponsor. Textiles and Tea is supported by the generous donations to the Fiber Trust. If you would like to see more programming like this, please support HTA by becoming a member or donating or 
both to um, HGA's Fiber Trust at weavespendie.org. If you've missed any part of this show, I know some people mentioned earlier they missed some, or if you want to watch it again or you want to share it with someone, all the textiles and tea are recorded. They are on the Ham Weavers Guild of America Facebook page. You do not have to have a Facebook account to watch them. So please go there and see all the textiles and tea. I'm very excited. Next week, I will have tea with Tea and Chew. I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you for being here, and I'll see you next Tuesday. Happy tea.